Evening all and welcome to our live stream for the second biology paper for OCR Gateway. Obviously, if you're sitting one of the other exam boards, then there could be topics that are not relevant to you. I honestly don't know what's on AQA or Red Excel. So OCR Gateway, we're going to cover the combined science, the biology, higher foundation, the lot, hopefully in about the next 90 minutes. This will stay on the channel afterwards so that if you want to obviously rewind and see other bits, then by all means, feel free. We will be going through relatively quickly because, as you will know from your revision, these are rather lengthy topics. So, as I say, you can rewind, you can pause, etc., and come back later, but we will be going relatively quick. I'll try and monitor the chat, but I won't be paying too much attention down there because, obviously, we've got a lot to get through. So let's start off then with B4. So the first thing that we're going to go over are just a few of these key terms that we need to know the meaning of. So ecosystem, first of all, is all of the living organisms and the physical conditions in the area. The community is all of the organisms within the ecosystem. The habitat is the area in which the organisms live. Producers are organisms that make their own food by photosynthesis, things like our plants. The consumers are the ones that don't make their own food and eat other organisms in order to gain their energy. And decomposers gain energy by feeding on dead or decaying matter. For those of you asking about grey boundaries, it's a fool's game to try to predict. We will find out in August. Until then, no one will be able to tell you what they're going to be. So you've just got to maximise your marks, folks. For those of you doing GCSE biology, hopefully we remember our key stage three work on food chains. So you start with your producer, use your little arrow to point to your primary consumer, arrow to the secondary consumer, and so on. So what we actually find, the ultimate source of all energy is the sun. So the plants will take in energy from the sun, which is absorbed by chlorophyll and used in photosynthesis to make the glucose which is obviously our photosynthesis equation, in case we've forgotten it, carbon dioxide plus water makes glucose and oxygen. And then that glucose is changed into carbohydrates and proteins in the plant. So when animals then eat the plants, biomass is transferred to the animals. But we do lose some energy due to respiration. When we're talking about biomass, this is the amount of living material present. So it doesn't include water here. Remember, food chains show us what organism eats what, and the direction that that arrow goes in shows the actual direction of the transfer of biomass or the transfer of energy. So don't have it going from your rabbit to the grass, because that's basically saying the grass is leaping over and consuming all the rabbits. Doesn't happen. If we're talking about a trophic level, that's a feeding level that shows the position of an organism in a food chain or food web. And our food webs just show all of the food chains linked together within a habitat. Back to everyone for combined now, as well as our separate sciences, we need to know the difference between biotic factors and abiotic factors. So biotic factors are living ones. And what we find there, that will be things like the number of organisms and which ones are actually present. Whereas abiotic factors, these are the non-living factors, things like the temperature, the pH, the amount of water. In terms of why we need these, if we think about light, first of all, that's needed for photosynthesis in our plants. So the greater the availability of light, then the greater the success of the plant. However, it's not saying that plants can't grow where there's only limited amounts of light because they've just evolved to grow successfully in those areas. So if you look at plants that are designed to grow in shady areas, then they've got really large surface areas to trap as much sunlight as possible. For the temperature, as we hopefully remember, then photosynthesis is an enzyme driven reaction. Therefore, it will control the rate of reaction of those enzymes. And in other organisms that don't carry out photosynthesis, we've got a lot of enzyme reactions, again, controlled by the temperature there. So this is where the ectotherms like lizards come into play, because you'll see them in the morning. They creep out and find a nice warm rock, which if you're staying in one of these hotels will be the path you're trying to walk on in order to actually increase their body temperature first thing in the morning to get all their reactions going. If we're talking about lack of water, if we don't have enough, things die. And obviously, if we've got our plants with a lack of water, then they wilt. And that means that the cells are no longer turgid. In terms of pH, then that's going to affect the biological activity in the soil, first of all, and it affects the availability of minerals. 
we'll find different plants grow in different pHs of soil. So that's why if you go and buy a whole range of plants and stick them in your garden, some will be brilliant and grow nicely and others will just look a little bit sad and not do a whole lot. One of the things you do need to be able to do in terms of RSS practicals is talk about how we can actually measure these different abiotic factors. So if you're asked how to measure light intensity, we use a light meter. If it's moisture, we use a humidity sensor, pH is a pH probe, and temperature, just a thermometer. The next thing we need to actually consider is this whole idea of competition and interdependence. So in order to survive, then plants and animals need a number of materials from the surroundings in which they live. And if those materials are in limited supply, they have to compete for them. So as a result of that competition, the weaker one is either going to die or just leave the area and go somewhere where there's less competition. Population is the number of organisms of each species living in an area and competition will have a direct effect on that population size. Do remember when we're talking about competition, it's not just animals that are competing. Plants also compete for water, minerals, space, etc. That word interdependence just means how different organisms depend on each other in a community. So they've actually got these ecological relationships with one another. And there are three main types we need to remember here. Predation, mutualism and parasitism. So predation is the one where we've got predators and prey. And the most likely thing they could ask is this little graph. They love this graph. It's the one that shows the relationship between predator and prey numbers. So this one used to come up for a couple of marks. So you'd be asked to describe or explain depending on which tier of paper you were on. So if we were describing, we say what we see. So the red line is the hare, which is our prey. The blue line is the lynx, which is our predator. So we can see that as the actual prey line increases, the predator line increases. And then when the prey decrease, the predators decrease. The way we get our second mark is for talking about the fact that there's this lag, so this delay between the effect in the other. If it was an explain, you'd have to obviously talk about the fact that when the amount of prey go up, that means there's more food available for the predators, so they increase. And when the prey obviously are decreasing, that means that there's less food for the predators, so they decrease. But do make sure that you talk about that lag as well, because that will be worth one of the marks if that comes up. Second relationship, mutualism. This is where both organisms are going to benefit. And a good example of this is the oxpecker and the buffalo. So oxpeckers are those little birds that sit on the back of buffaloes, quite happily munching on all the parasites living on their skin. Buffalo benefits because there's no parasites. And the oxpeckers are less likely to be eaten because they're sitting on a buffalo. Not many things are going to try to catch them there. Third one, parasitism. This is where only the parasite benefits, and it's usually at the expense of the host, so the host suffers. Good example of this is a tapeworm. So if you've got a tapeworm inside your body, it's benefiting because every bit of food you eat, it's stealing all of those valuable nutrients, and you're not getting them. You're suffering as a result of that. For those of you doing GCSE biology, you need to know about the pyramids. So pyramid of numbers, first of all. The length of the bar there just tells us the number of organisms in a trophic level. And when we're drawing them, producer always at the bottom, then the primary, then the secondary and tertiary consumer on top. Pyramids of numbers won't always be pyramid shaped because we could have one oak tree which has thousands of insects living off it, but it still has that little tiny bar at the bottom. When we're talking about the second type of pyramids, our pyramids of biomass, then these ones are always pyramid shaped. So that's always a good bit there that the pyramid shape will always be there for our pyramids of biomass. So when you're actually doing that, remember producers at the bottom, then the primary consumers and so on all the way up and label the bars. If they ask you to draw one, they will give you a little bit of graph paper printed in there. Pick an appropriate scale for the length of the bar, draw them with a ruler, ideally, and then write the names of them on each of those bars. When we're talking about how we actually calculate biomass, we take a sample from each trophic level, we work out the average mass of the organisms from each trophic level, and then we multiply it by the population size to give us our total biomass. Downside to this is it, re it requires dry mass, so we've got to dry out the organisms, which means they're dead, because 
Otherwise, water content would vary between the organisms and that would give us false readings. Still just for the GCSE biology folks here, when we're talking about this energy transfer that occurs in a food chain, then what we start off with is our producers are getting that sunlight. But only about 1% of that is actually going to be transferred to the chemical stores because most of it just reflects off the leaf. Much of the energy that actually goes into the plant won't be transferred on from the plant to the other consumers. It's only about half of it that goes into increasing biomass because the rest is lost in respiration. And each time we go through our food chain, we lose more biomass. So we'll lose it because not all of the organism is eaten. You won't see animals digging up all of the roots to eat the entirety of the plant. The roots will stay in the ground. They just eat the top bit. They also don't devour all of the bones. Generally speaking, the flesh will be picked off and you're just left with the dodgy little bones at the end. We'll lose some in respiration as well. We also have egestion, which is undigested material being lost from the body as feces, and excretion, which is where the waste products are lost, e.g. your urine there. We do find as a result of this loss of biomass that our food chains are limited in their length, usually to four trophic levels. Beyond that, we have insufficient energy to support life. They could ask you to calculate the efficiency of biomass transfer, and all we do there is your biomass available after the transfer divided by the biomass available before the transfer times it by 100 to give it as a percentage. Back for everyone, so combined and the GCSE Biology Higher Foundation, the whole lot of you here, we're coming on to look at these different cycles. Hopefully we remember that plants actually get all the minerals they need from the soil, and these are basically passed on to the animals when they eat the plants. When the organisms die, it gets returned to the soil by decomposers. Now, what we actually find is we've got three key cycles we need to know. So we're going to start with probably the more complicated of them, which is our nitrogen cycle. So you're probably very familiar with this little diagram of the nitrogen cycle. So we start off with nitrogen in the air and then nitrogen fixing bacteria convert the nitrogen into nitrates, which can then be absorbed by our plants. Our plants will then use that in order to make proteins, which get passed from the plant to the animals when they're eaten. Obviously, what we'll find is these two things, they're living things, so they can die, at which point we have our decay carried out by the decomposers, bacteria and fungi, which will convert the proteins into ammonia. Then we could also have our nitrifying bacteria, which change our ammonia into nitrates. And the only other bacteria we've got on there are the denitrifying bacteria, which basically change our nitrates into nitrogen gas. So four types of bacteria to remember there. Decomposers, proteins to ammonia. Nitrifying bacteria, ammonia to nitrates. Nitrogen fixing is nitrogen gas to nitrates. And denitrifying is nitrates to nitrogen. Just remember that when we're talking about the nitrates being taken up by the plant, use the phrase absorbed by the roots. They have been picky in the past about it, so don't say it sucks it up or any weird phrases. Absorbed by the roots is the way to go there. Second cycle is the water cycle. So what we've got here are a few key words. The cycle itself is pretty straightforward. We just need to know the scientific terms for each of those stages. So if we start up here with our clouds, because we live in England, so it rains a lot, then what we've got, precipitation, first of all, is basically where the water is falling from the clouds. It hits the land. Some of it is going to run straight off into our rivers, lakes, oceans, etc. But some of it will also go through the ground in a process called percolation. So that's where it trickles through the little gaps between the soil and the rocks and ends up in the actual water table. It will be absorbed by the roots of our plants and lost in transpiration, which is the loss of water vapor from the aerial parts of a plant, where we've got our water vapor here, which is joined by the evaporated water from things like the oceans, the lakes, etc. As the water vapor rises, then it gets cooled, and that means it's going to condense to make our clouds. They further cool and back to precipitation once more. So that's cycle number two. Third and final one, the carbon cycle then. This one has far fewer processes, which is nice. We start with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the only way that's removed is by photosynthesis. 
So carbon dioxide is removed by photosynthesis carried out by our plants. Then those carbon compounds that our plants have made can be passed on to the animals when they're actually eaten. Both plants and animals can die, which means decomposition again. And we've also got respiration of every living thing, whether it is the bacteria carrying out the decomposition, the animals, the plants, all have respiration returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Other things might just end up being buried underground for millions of years and turning into our fossil fuels. And then when we burn them, we release carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere again. So remember, carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere by respiration, decomposition and combustion. And it's taken out of the atmosphere by photosynthesis. So as long as you know those four processes, you can talk about the carbon cycle quite well. One thing to remember about the carbon cycle is the levels of carbon dioxide in our air actually vary throughout the day. Main reason for that is that photosynthesis can only happen during daylight hours. So that means carbon dioxide will be removed in the day only. But what we find is respiration happens all the time in living cells. So that means carbon dioxide is being released at a constant rate. So what we actually find is in the daytime, then we're lowering it slightly because of photosynthesis. But at night, then obviously all we're doing is making carbon dioxide. So the levels go up. So you get a little bit of a zigzaggy line. But the general trend that we can see over the years is that the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is increasing. And that's mainly down to good old humans. So we do a lot of things that release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, more cars, more industry, more power plants, burning fossil fuels, cutting down trees left, right and centre and deforestation. All of that is going to lead to the increase. So as long as you can give two answers there, you're absolutely fine on saying why the carbon dioxide levels are going up. In terms of the decomposers, then we've mentioned them in a few of those cycles there. These are microorganisms, they're bacteria and fungi. So they're the two to remember. And what they do is they break down the dead organic material as well as any urine and feces and return those minerals then back to the soil, which our plants can then absorb. We've got a word we use here, which is saprophytes. And that means that these are organisms that actually secrete enzymes from themselves onto the surface of the dead material. The enzymes then break it down and they absorb just the nutrients afterwards. So that's what our decomposers are doing. They're saprophytes. They secrete enzymes onto the surface and then just absorb the products of that digestion. A word not to mix up here is a detritivore. So these are small little animals that we find lurking around all the time. And what they do is speed up decomposition by breaking organic material up into very small pieces. And the reason that that speeds it up is because it creates a much larger surface area for the decomposers to work on. Good examples of these are earthworms that will do that to leaves and wood lice that do it to wood, as their name suggests. And of course, the good old maggot, which will munch its way through animal material. For those of you doing GCSE biology, we do need to know how we can actually affect the rate of decomposition. And their old favourite was talking about a compost heap for some reason. So if they ask you a weird question about how a gardener can increase the rate of decay in their compost heap, basically you can say, make sure it's warm, make sure it's moist and that there's plenty of oxygen and then explain how they do that. So turning it over to increase the oxygen, watering it every few days to keep it moist. That means that we will then have a much faster rate of decomposition. If they ask you about how to calculate the rate of decay, all you do is the change in mass divided by the length of time, and that gives you your rate of decay. So that's all of B4 already done for you. Next up is B5. So B5 was all about the genetics, natural selection bits. So I think I've not missed anything that people have asked so far. As I say, if you've got any questions in particular, post them in the chat and I will go through them at the end, if not before. So when we're talking about variation, these are the differences within a species. If we use the word phenotype, that means it's the observable characteristics. So things like blue eyes and black hair, those are phenotypes. We've got two categories of variation, genetic and environmental. So what we find genetic variation is caused by the genes which are inherited from the parents. So things like eye color, blood group, etc and environmental variation is caused by the environment in which you live. 
So things like your accent, any scars. What we do find, though, is that there are a range of characteristics that are actually caused by both environmental and genetic variations. So that's things like your height, for example. You will have genes that affect it, but if you don't have a really good diet when you're young and growing, you're not going to reach your maximum height, I'm afraid. When we're talking about variation, we can classify them as either continuous or discontinuous. So continuous variations can take any value within a range, and these are caused by genetic and environmental variations. They're usually controlled by multiple genes, and it's things like height would be a good example here. If they ask you what kind of graph we use for continuous variation, it's a histogram. And hopefully remember from maths that histograms have no gaps between the bars that we're plotting. For discontinuous, these can result in discrete values, and they're caused by genetic variation and usually one gene. So this is things like gender or eye color. So what we do with this one is we display it on a bar chart. So those ones, we've got the gaps between the bars. So just remember that because that could be one of your maths content questions. In terms of how we actually produce offspring, we've got two options available. First one is asexual reproduction, and this results in a clone. Now, a clone is just an organism that is genetically identical to the parent. Remember that phrase, genetically identical. Good example of this is bacteria. They reproduce asexually, so the offspring are genetically identical to that parent cell. So the way they do this is a process that we looked at in our paper one for biology, which is mitosis. So plants are also able to use asexual reproduction in a few cases. Things like your spider plants that you've probably got in your science lab at school. Those little runners with the teeny little spider plants on the end, they're clones of the parent plant. Also potato plants with their tubers, daffodils with their bulbs, all examples of asexual reproduction. We've also got a couple of animals that use asexual reproduction, so starfish and sea anemones. Second option is sexual reproduction. So what we see here is we need two parents, first of all, and we get genetic variation as a result of DNA coming from both of the actual parents there. And this is what's used by most animals. So when we're talking about sexual reproduction, we do need sex cells, which are known as gametes. So in humans, sperm and the egg are the gametes. So egg cells made in the ovaries, sperm cells made in the testes. Let's hope they don't go with A-level biology on that one because we're not going there today. Now, the gametes are actually made through a process called meiosis. This is where we've got to go careful on our spelling. Now, in the past, they've always been relatively generous in the spellings. You don't have to get it literally letter perfect, but meiosis and mitosis, the thing they're looking for is that when you're writing meiosis, there is no letter T in it. As soon as you put a T in there and have some weird amalgamation of meiosis and mitosis, it's wrong, I'm afraid. So the reason we use meiosis is because we then make haploid gametes. So that means we've only got half the number of chromosomes as a normal body cell. We've got plants that will also use sexual reproduction. So the pollen is the male gamete, and we've got an egg cell, which is the female gamete, and that then will fuse to make the seed for our new plant. For those who are doing GCSE biology, we need to be able to compare these as pros and cons. So in terms of asexual reproduction, first of all, two key advantages here. One is that if the parent is well adapted to the environment, all of the offspring will be as well. And secondly, we only need one parent, so it's much faster. Downside to asexual reproduction, though, is that one change in abiotic or abiotic factor could wipe out the whole lot of them because they're all genetically identical, so they're all equally susceptible. For sexual reproduction, the key advantage is we get variation. And the key disadvantage is the fact that we've got two parents needed, so it's going to be a much slower process. We do have a couple of little oddities in the actual natural world, like sea anemones, who are capable of using both sexual and asexual reproduction, depending on the scenario. Back for everyone again, so combined and the GCSE biology folks, we're going to go through meiosis now. 
So hopefully we know that a normal human body cell has 46 chromosomes. So they're diploid cells. They've got two sets of each chromosome. However, our sex cells, the gametes, only have 23 haploid cells, one set of each chromosome. During fertilization, the two haploid gametes join together and their nuclei fuse to make the diploid cell called a zygote. That zygote then divides many times by mitosis in order to produce a new organism. Do remember that every organism produced by sexual reproduction has a unique genome, with the exception of identical twins. When we are looking at our meiosis, we will produce four haploid cells from one diploid parent cell. So in humans, it will take place in the ovaries and the testes, remember. In terms of what's going to happen in meiosis, the good news, if you did good revision for paper one and learnt mitosis, you've got half of meiosis already sorted. Because the first thing that happens is our chromosomes are going to be copied. So the DNA replicates. We can talk about that. Obviously, the DNA unzips, then the complementary base pairs come in to create another set of the DNA. Once that's happened, the chromosomes line up along the equator in pairs, and then they're pulled to the opposite poles, and the cell divides into two through the process of cytokinesis, exactly the same as mitosis. The key difference is we then get a second lining up and division. So the chromosomes line up along the equator again, they're pulled to the opposite poles, the cells divide, and we've got four haploid gametes. So make sure you remember it is just those two things that are going to occur. First, mitosis, then a second line up, opposite poles, divide. When we're talking about variation, we've got a few causes of it here. Firstly, we get random assortment of the chromosomes at the equator. And what we mean by that, it's not a case of all of the chromosomes from the mother line up on the left and all the ones from the father line up on the right, completely random how they line up, which means it's going to be random which cells they end up in. When they are all lined up, we do have a process called crossing over, which can occur, which is where little bits of the chromosome actually sort of swap between them. So a little bit of the mother's chromosome ends up on the father's and so vice versa. And we then have the random fertilization of an egg with a sperm. So it's completely down to random chance what happens there. When we are looking at your genes, you've got two copies, one from the mother and one from the father. Now, those genes could be the same or they could be different. And what we use here is one term that we need to remember, allele, which is the different form of a gene. So we have a gene for eye color but we have alleles for blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, etc. Now, what we find is that many phenotypes, so remember the phenotype, the characteristic we see, is caused by the influence of multiple genes rather than just a single gene. We just dumb it down a little bit for GCSE to make it a little bit easier to do. So believe me, when I'm sitting here saying, oh, eye colour, you've got your one allele for blue eyes, one allele for brown eyes, etc. Totally lying, but you'll get used to that when you do A-level biology, if you go that way. Two words we do need to know, dominant and recessive. So dominant alleles are basically going to be the traits that we see if either one or two dominant alleles are present. And we represent them with a capital letter on a diagram. Recessive alleles are the ones that will only be expressed if both are recessive alleles. Now these are represented by our lowercase letter. Now that's important when we actually come on to do our genetic cross diagrams. Few other keywords we do need to know the meaning of then. First of all, the genotype is just the combination of alleles that are present within the organism. If we see the phrase homozygous dominant, then homo means same, zygous genes, so same genes, and the dominant means they're both dominant. So we've got two dominant alleles present. Homozygous recessive means they're both recessive alleles, and heterozygous, hetero is different, so different genes means that we will have one dominant, one recessive. So make sure you know those words, because if they're being a little bit mean on a genetic cross question, they could tell you that the father is heterozygous and the mother is homozygous recessive. Draw the genetic cross diagram for their offspring. So if you don't know what those words mean, you can't even attempt the question. Now, when we come to draw our genetic cross, it's a Punnett square that we're doing here. So basically, you kind of draw a dodgy little window. So just like the weird windows everyone used to draw as a child on houses, 
we start off with one of those. And then if we've got heterozygous parents, which have both got brown eyes and blue eyes is recessive, then we would end up with this as our starting point. So we've got heterozygous parents. So that means that these are going to be different alleles. So one dominant, one recessive, one dominant, one recessive. And then all you do is whatever's at the top, you put in the cells beneath and whatever's on the left, you just copy across to the right. So we end up with our little diagram like this. The only other thing we need to add in here is for each of these squares, make sure that you've written in brown eyes, brown eyes, brown eyes, and blue eyes, and then the percentage. So if it was asking how many would have blue eyes, it'd be 25% blue eyes, because these would obviously be brown because brown is dominant and they've got one of those alleles present. So do make sure that you put in all of those bits, otherwise you could throw away some marks because that could very easily be a four marker. I'd say likely to come up, but I can't guarantee it, obviously. One other question I used to quite like was asking about what determines the actual sex of an organism. So in terms of humans, it's the X and Y chromosomes. If they ask you what chromosomes are present in a male, then don't just write down Y, okay? It's an X and a Y. And in females, don't just write X, you've got to do XX. So that's where they get a little bit picky at times, but make sure that you do know that. Next little bit is about mutation. So a mutation is a change in the base sequence in the DNA. Now, mutations occur spontaneously during DNA replication all the time. It's just our bodies usually repair that so we don't notice. But the chance of a mutation occurring will increase if we're exposed to things like ionizing radiation, such as ultraviolet, and if we're exposed to certain chemicals like benzene, for example. What we actually find is that as a result of mutations changing the DNA, then this is going to lead to different versions of an allele arising. So this gives us our genetic variation. Now, when we have a mutation, it may show no effect on the phenotype. It could influence the phenotype or it could completely determine it. Now, these mutations could be harmful, beneficial or neutral. So good examples of harmful mutations. Most common one is cancer. So that means that your cells are growing and dividing in an uncontrolled manner. We could also see the cystic fibrosis mutation, which is where we've got an abnormal channel protein being produced as opposed to the normal one. And we could also produce different shaped protein molecules. And the good example of that is in sickle cell anemia. If we've got neutral mutations, then tongue rolling, that's completely irrelevant to your survival ability. It's just a fun quirk. And the beneficial mutations would be things like antibiotic resistance in bacteria or skin color. For those of you asking, that was the actual combined bit. When we do any of the GCSE biology bit, I'll tell you when it is. Like this bit I'm about to do now is just for the GCSE biology higher tier folks. When we're thinking about our DNA, then it's organized into coding sections, which are separated by non-coding DNA. So you have a gene that's going to code for a particular protein, a little bit of DNA between that and the next gene that's just non-coding. Now, when we're talking about our mutations, then what we could see is we've got three possible options here. So we could change a base, so literally just swap one for another. We can add a base or we can delete a base. So when we change one base, that only affects a single amino acid. So potentially far less significant there. If we add or delete a base though, what we do is we change all of the triplet sequences that then come after that as well. So those are far wider reaching impacts. So if we add a base in, you change that first triplet and then each of the triplets that comes after it. Just like deleting, it will change your first amino acid and each one that comes after it as well. If we change the amino acid sequence, then the way the protein folds can be changed or we could just make completely the wrong protein. And that links all the way back to the work we did on enzymes in B1. So think back to that. They could ask how a mutation would prevent a reaction taking place. If it's changed the DNA sequence, it's changed which amino acid goes into the protein, which means the active site would be a different shape. It won't fit the substrate anymore. So make sure you know your enzyme work as well for this.
We do also have these start codons, which we find just before each gene in that non-coding section of the DNA. And they're the ones that actually trigger transcription. So if the mutation is in the start codon, then the gene may not actually be transcribed at all, which means we just don't make the protein full stop. Still just for the GCSE biology higher tier folks, we need to know about the scientists involved in basically the history of genetics. Well, I don't think we actually had a scientist question yet, so it could be coming. What we've got, first of all, the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. So he was the monk that played around in the monastery gardens with pea plants because that's how he loved to spend his time. And he came up with the idea that characteristics are passed on from parents to offspring. And he called this little unit that passed them on hereditary units. Now, he said that those units are passed on, one from each parent, and they can either be dominant or recessive. Next up was Misha, and he discovered this substance called nuclein because he discovered an acidic substance present in the nucleus and called it nuclein. Next up is Oswald Avery, and what he actually did was transfer DNA between bacteria. So he passed on the ability to cause disease from one strain of bacteria to another, and that showed that genes are made of DNA. Our next scientist is Erwin Shargoff, and he discovered base pairs. So he did experiments here that allowed us to identify the fact that the amount of adenine is the same as the amount of thymine, and the amount of cytosine the same as the amount of guanine. So he said that obviously these pair up together. So even though different organisms have different amounts of DNA, all of the DNA has equal quantities of the adenine and thymine, and then the cytosine and guanine. The next ones, hopefully people that we do know, Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins. Now, Rosalind Franklin actually photographed DNA crystals using X-ray crystallography. And it was her photograph of the actual X-ray of the DNA structure that then allowed Watson and Crick to come up with the double helix structure. So remember the names of those scientists because they are very important to the history of genetics. Since then, we've discovered many individual genes that code for inherited disorders. We've come up with genetic engineering as an entire field of research. In 2003, we completed the Human Genome Project, and that was basically where we sequenced all of the genes in the entire human body. And since then, we've been working on gene therapy, which is the ability to replace those faulty genes with normal genes. Back to everyone, so combined and GCSE Biology Higher and Foundation for natural selection now. So hopefully we know that evolution is the gradual change in a species over time. This is not something that happens overnight. This takes a long time. So organisms actually evolve through this process of natural selection. So we've got five steps we need to remember here. First one is variation. So all organisms within a species will show some kind of variation to each other, as long as they're not all clones, obviously. And what we find is, as mutations occur, variation increases. Step two, survival of the fittest. This is where the organisms that are best adapted for their environment will survive. Those who aren't well adapted just die. Third step, reproduction. So those that are best adapted are more likely to survive until they're able to reproduce, which means step four, they pass on their advantage. So the genes from the parent are passed on to the offspring which means the offspring are more likely to have the same advantageous characteristics of their parents. The last one, step five, is repeat. This happens over and over again over a long period of time and can eventually lead to the development of a new species. So in terms of examples about our actual natural selection, first one is the peppered moth. So before the 19th century, then the majority of peppered moths were light colored because they camouflaged on the trees and any dark colored ones stood out like a sore thumb and the birds used to eat those. However, when the industrial revolution took place, then everything got covered in soot. It was a very unpleasant place to live. And that meant that the dark moths were better camouflaged. Therefore, the lighter colored moths were eaten by the birds, the dark colored moths increased. Another example is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So that mutation of being able to resist antibiotics is big benefit to bacteria. It allows them to survive. So one of the problems of that for us as a human race is we've now got infections that our antibiotics do nothing for. When we're looking at evidence for evolution, the key thing we have here are fossils. 
So hopefully we know that fossils are formed when the remains of animals or plants are mineralized and the deeper underground you go, the older the fossil actually is. So what we can do is by digging up all these fossils and noting the actual age of the ground that we're digging them from, then we can put together the fossil record, which is a key piece of evo evidence for evolution. In our oldest rocks, we do have fossilized bacteria and the more recent rocks contain more complex organism fossils. So this suggests that life on Earth actually evolved from bacteria in the first instance. We also find that plant fossils occur before animal fossils. So it tells us that before animals could evolve, plants had to evolve. We can also get evidence from fossils that show closely related organisms have evolved from the same ancestor as well. Look out for some random setting for this. I obviously probably looked at something like the horse but they could pick anything else and ask you how you can see that they are related. And then you're just looking at those gradual changes over time, talking about the fact that the fossils show that it was this slow change and the ones that are more closely related are in the same kind of age period or time periods. In terms of other evidence, we can use things like bacteria and the Atlantic tomcod because they actually have very rapid reproduction rates. So we can study evolution in a shorter time frame. We can also carry out the molecular comparison of DNA and proteins because closely related species have most similar DNA and amino acid order in proteins. Obviously, if things don't adapt to their environment, then they're likely to become extinct. For those of you doing just GCSE biology now, we need to know about the theory of evolution. So hopefully we know that originally then everyone believed that obviously God created everything. It was one of those days where this entity just sat there and thought, oh, let's have this, 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 and then just popped into existence all of these little things. Then Charles Darwin came along and kind of scuppered all of those wonderful ideas by the church. So he actually went around the Galapagos Islands on the HMS Beagle. And he'd actually read a book on geology by Lyle that suggested fossils were evidence that animals lived millions of years ago and what they were like. Now, what Darwin actually did as he was going around the Galapagos Islands was he took samples and did lots of drawings and studies on particularly the finches that he found there. And he noticed that the shape of their beaks was very closely linked to the food source available on those islands. And that led him to his theory of natural selection. Now, at the same time that Darwin was going around the Galapagos Islands and coming up with his theory, then we also had Wallace working in Borneo. And they basically came up with the same idea of this natural selection. So Wallace had sent his ideas to Darwin for peer review before he published his own theory. And remember, peer review is all about the fact that you get another scientist to check your work for any errors. Then after that, because they realized that their work was so similar, they actually presented the two papers jointly. So they published their work so that the general public also knew about it. Bad news for Darwin, though, when he did publish his work, then he was slightly mocked in the press. So a few years ago, they put up a picture of him from the press where he's got the monkey's body with his head stuck on it. And the whole idea there is just talking about the fact that it's not always readily accepted when we come up with these new ideas, particularly when it's going against those accepted ideas from religion. So very controversial because it went against the Bible and it took a while for people to actually accept it. But now we've got a lot of evidence, so it is accepted. Back to combined science, higher foundation and the GCSE biology folks. Classification is next. So classification is where we sort living organisms into groups based on similar characteristics. And we classify organisms so that we can identify species, so we can predict their characteristics and show evolutionary links. If we're talking about a species, the definition we need to remember is that it's a group of organisms which are able to reproduce to produce fertile offspring. Usually a two marker, first bit for saying a group of organisms that can reproduce, second mark, producing fertile offspring. We've got seven taxonomic levels, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. By the time we get down to species, it's just the one type of organism there, whereas in the kingdom, very big and vast. Five kingdoms that we split everything in the planet into, plants, animals, fungi, protoctista, and prokaryotes. We have two options for our classification. We can use artificial classification system, which uses observable characteristics. 
So this one doesn't consider evolutionary relationships at all. It's literally going, it's got wings, it goes into the group of the winged creatures. Natural classification system is based on evolutionary relationships, and we determine that through DNA analysis. can work out the family trees in terms of genetics of organisms. That's all of B5, so now on to B6. So the start of B6 is looking at the different sampling techniques, which is again one of our assessed practicals. So hopefully we all had a chance to use some of these bits of equipment. First one, the quadrat. So that was the square frame of a fixed area. So we use that for sampling plants, okay? We do not use a quadrat for sampling an animal. If they were to ask you how you would actually take a sample of the number of cheetahs living in a particular habitat, the answer is not a quadrat. Because when you place your quadrat down, it's highly unlikely a cheetah will be sitting there going, it's all right, I'll wait while you count me. So it's all about our plants. Pooters are the next ones. So they are the little pots with the two straws, making sure you suck through the one with the little mesh coating on the bottom. Otherwise, mouthful of bugs, not pleasant. So we use those to collect tiny insects. Your pitfall traps are where we have buried a jar in the ground and put a little roof over it to stop it filling with water. Sweet nets, big nets, you just sweep them through a field to catch grasshoppers, butterflies, etc. A transect line is how we would actually study something like the distribution of plants up a beach or as you're coming out from shady areas, etc. So you take a tape measure, you run it along the area you're studying, and then you place your quadrats at fixed points. Kick sampling is when we're using rivers, so you kick it and then bits of the bank and it disturbs the sort of bits in the bottom and then you've got a net further downstream where you can catch and count and tree beating is where we get a big white sheet stretch it under a tree and then shake it until everything falls out and then we can count and see what's what down there so make sure you know those different techniques because they could ask you a six marker about how you would actually carry out sampling for something the other thing to bear in mind is that when we're collecting these organisms, we need to identify what we've actually got. And we do that through the use of a key. So we've got two types of key, the spider or branched key, where we start off with plants at the top, and then you've got two arrows that come down. One says broad leaves, other narrow leaves. So if they're broad leaves, you go that way, narrow leaves, you go that way. And you just keep following it down until you end up with the name of the species at the bottom. Or we have the numbered keys, these are the ones where it's kind of like those choose your own adventure stories you may have read when you're a child. So you kind of have your little question, leaves narrow, go to two, and then you go to that question number and so on until it tells you your final one. When we are talking about sampling, particularly if we're using sweet nets for grasshoppers and things like this, then we need to know about the capture recapture technique. So what we've actually got is in this one, you go out, you use your sampling technique to capture, count and mark those organisms. When we're marking them, we need to do so in a way that's not going to mean that they're going to get eaten instantly or just die. So if you're marking with a little spot of nail varnish on their back, you won't pick fluorescent pink as the colour because it will make them stand out a little bit. And you'll also make sure you're not sticking their legs to their body or they're not really moving much. Once you've done that, then you release them you go away and then come back a fixed time period later and then you use the exact same technique to then recapture a second sample so once you've recaptured you will count the number that are marked the number that are unmarked and then we use our calculation number in the first sample times the number in the second sample divided by the number in the second sample that were marked and that gives us the population size it does make two assumptions though that there's no death and there's no immigration or emigration from the area. We've got two options in terms of our sampling. Could be random sampling, which is where you generally use tape measures to mark a grid on your field, and then a random number generator to tell you your coordinates to place the quadrat. And the reason we do that is to remove any bias. Or non-random sampling is where we're actually looking to see how distribution changes over a distance. So if we wanted to do an investigation to see how the number and species of plants changed as we move from shady areas into light areas, you run a tape measure from the shaded part right the way out into the nice sunny area. And then every meter or two meters, you place your quadrat and count the organisms that are present within there.
Same idea if you were given the question on a beach. You just run it from the sea up the beach and then place your quadrats at those fixed intervals and then you know what's there. If they were being particularly mean, they could give you a kite diagram for that. So the kite diagrams are just a type of graph where the width of the bar represents the actual distribution. So it's a very dodgy diagram, but it gives you an idea. So the width here tells us the distribution. So this is the distance, and that's obviously the numbers. And normally you'd have a couple on there. So you'd have one there that you've got large numbers close to the sea, and then you'd have another one where you've got the opposite. So it would be lots of the plants up here with only a couple down here. So just make sure you know about that just in case they're being mean, because I can't guarantee it. The next thing we need to look at is biodiversity. So biodiversity is the variety of living things in an area. And we actually rely on biodiversity a lot for the raw materials we need for everything in our lives. However, we are also, as the human race, the leading cause of the loss of biodiversity due to our ever-increasing human population around the world. So because of our increasing population, we are carrying out vast amounts of deforestation. So that's the permanent removal of these large areas of forest. We're doing that, obviously, to give us the actual material to, to carry out buildings. And we're also going to be building houses in that area as well. The downside is it's going to reduce the number of trees, which means we're reducing the number of supported animal species. Another problem, agriculture. We generally remove these nice areas of natural vegetation in order to replace it with one field of one crop. So that means we're reducing the variety there. So organisms will also be limited. We'll also carry out hunting and fishing in order to feed our population or just because some people apparently like to kill animals for fun. I don't get it, but some people do. Where we're fishing, then we can overfish, which means that we've lost species from an area or massively decreased their population. If we're hunting, we can decrease food for another organism or remove a key part of the food chain. If we're talking about pollution, then obviously the more polluted an area, the fewer organisms that can live there. And a key problem of this one is eutrophication. So eutrophication is where we use loads of fertilizers on our fields. That then runs off into rivers and lakes. We get an algal bloom, so that real population explosion of our algae, and it covers the entire surface of the water. So that blocks the light, so any plants in our river die. And then as the microorganisms decompose them, they use all of the oxygen from the water and all the fish then die. So just by using too much fertilizer, we can wipe out entire populations within the lakes and rivers. If we talk about an endangered species, this is one where there's only a limited number left. So they're at risk of becoming extinct unless we do something dramatic and extinct. Everything's dead. So what we do is we use conservation, which is the idea of protecting a natural environment to ensure that habitats are not lost. And we use what's called active management of habitats. So that just means you can still use the resources, but in a sustainable way. So good examples of active management are things like restricting human access or things like feeding animals. So in Borneo, they've actually got feeding platforms for the orangutans so because they've got limited food supplies left because of the deforestation there. We could reintroduce species as well to an area where they've been reduced or lost. One of the key things that provides the organisms for that reintroduction is captive breeding. So our captive breeding programs are aiming to create a stable and healthy population of a species that we can then gradually reintroduce into their natural habitat. A couple of problems with this, though. Firstly, it's not always easy to maintain genetic diversity because we only have a very limited number of breeding partners within the zoos. So that means genetic variation is limited there. And secondly, when we're breeding organisms in captivity, they may not be suitable for release. It might be that their natural habitat just doesn't exist anymore, or it might be that they've not got the skills to actually survive in the wild on their own. If we're thinking about plants as well, we need to protect those from extinction too. And we use seed banks for this. So basically up in the Arctic Circle, we've actually got a vault buried in the actual ice there with big containers filled with seeds of all different plants from all over the world. So that in theory, in case of apocalypse, then we can go to our seed vault, take them all out and then replant the plants once more. 
one of the ways that we have to maintain biodiversity is through actually working together and having laws. So they've got local and international cooperation required to actually bring this about. In terms of international organisations, you've got the IUCN, which publishes the Red List, and that tells countries about the species that need conservation and the threats that are basically putting them at risk of extinction. We also have the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, which is a treaty that regulates the international trade of certain wild plants, animals and their products. So it's that one that sort of said we're not going to buy products that are made from ivory in the whole attempt to reduce obviously poaching there. We also have the Rio Conventions, which require countries to develop strategies for sustainable development, reduce their greenhouse emissions and combat desertification with the overall aim there of maintaining biodiversity. If we think about the local agreements, then that's obviously down to individual countries as to what their specific needs are. It's not very good saying everyone around the world must do the following things because all countries have different things that are actually living there and therefore different requirements. So in England, for example, we use stewardship schemes, which means the government pay farmers to conserve their landscape. So they'll give them a payment not to plant a field for a year and leave it to natural growth. One other thing that we can have is ecotourism. Now, tourism is good and bad for countries. Tourists bring in lots of money, which is very useful because we can use that to in extend, improve habitats, prevent poaching, etc. But tourists also are notorious for being a little bit interesting with what they respect in nature at times. So by using ecotourism, that's the idea that we don't have negative impacts on the natural environment or local communities while still bringing in the money. So it's a case of keeping tourists to footpaths rather than letting them trample across the endangered plants and animals in the area. It means that when you've got breeding grounds that you're protecting them, keeping people away from them. So if you go to places like Mexico, then you've got a lot of these little turtle breeding areas. So that literally they just come up from the sea and lay their eggs on the beach. Just because you want to have your sun lounger there doesn't mean that the turtle's going to think, actually, you know, I'll go down there. They don't. So what they actually do in a lot of areas, they put little domes and tents over any of the nests or some hotels actually do dig up the eggs from that area that they've laid where the beach is. And then they have turtle hatcheries a little bit further down where they keep the eggs nice and safe. And then they all hatch and off the little baby turtles go back to the sea. We do have some downsides of this, though, because if we're designating everyone has to use the same trail or footpath, we can see soil erosion happening there. For those of you doing GCSE biology higher tier, we need to know about how we can monitor biodiversity. So what we're actually doing here is taking samples of plants and animals from a habitat to monitor the type and number present. Now, we use indicator species, which are the organisms that we can use to measure environmental quality just by whether they're there or not. If we're thinking about air pollution, then sulfur dioxide is one of the most common forms of air pollution because it comes from the combustion of fossil fuels. Sulfur dioxide causes acid rain. Acid rain can kill trees, fish, etc. And one of the key indicator species for air pollution are lichens. Now, because they have no root systems, all of their nutrition comes from the air. And what we find is depending on which lichens are present, we know the level of air pollution in the area. So what we find is some of the very branched, little airy looking ones, they will only grow in nice clean air. Whereas if you look outside your nearest window and look at a roof, you'll probably see a yellow, crusty looking one because they grow where there's plenty of nitrogen. So if you're in an area by the coast, then where your seagulls will go and sit and poop, you see that lichen because plenty of nitrogen. Still just for GCSE biology higher tier, we need to about the water pollution indicator species as well. So what we've got here, their names kind of give away whether it's polluted or not. So mayfly larva, unpolluted, freshwater shrimp, low pollution, water louse, high pollution, and sludge worms, very high. Bit of a giveaway, if something is sludge, it's probably not a clean water supply. They've given you questions in the past where they've asked you to identify where pollution was released on a little diagram, and they've given you numbers of the different indicator species. So as long as you know what they represent, you should be able to do that. 
for just GCSE biology, but higher and foundation tier folks, we need to know that food security is the ability of human populations to access affordable food of sufficient quality and quantity. So we've got various factors that threaten our food security. First of all, back to increasing populations of humans again. We've also got climate change and new pathogens or pests evolving. And we've obviously taken several steps to try to maximize our production. First of all, we're maximizing photosynthesis by using glass houses. It's a greenhouse for normal humans, but OCR refer to them as a glass house for some reason. And that means we can control light intensity, temperature, water, etc. We use fertilizers. We will use various other chemicals to kill off things that interrupt our food production. And we can use pest resistant varieties of crops. In terms of the chemicals we use other than fertilizers, we've got fungicides which kill fungi, pesticides kill pests, insecticides kill insects, and herbicides don't kill herbs, they kill weeds. We've got two options for our farming, intensive or organic. Intensive farming is using techniques to produce the maximum yield of food from the minimum area of land. So this is the battery farming, it's using pesticides, it's using fertilizers, it's using machinery. Any of that is intensive. Organic farming is using the natural methods of producing crops and animals to avoid the use of chemicals. So what we find there is we spread manure instead of artificial fertilizers, we use crop rotation. We will use the pest resistant varieties of crops and things like this. And we can also use biological control instead of pesticides. So biological control is where we're using the natural predators of the pest to control their numbers. Downside to this one, though, is they are living things we are releasing, which does mean the predators might decide just to up and leave your area without eating your pests. Bit of a problem. And they may just decide to eat something other than the pest. So you might release all of your ladybirds in with the idea they're going to eat all of the aphids and they eat a different insect instead, leaving the aphids to desiccate your, your entire crops. Still just for GCSE biology folks, we need to know about how we can counteract this through a few different techniques. First one is fish farming. So we know that fish are a valuable source of protein and overfishing has led to big population reductions for some species. So a lot of international organizations have introduced fishing quotas to limit the number and types of fish that can be caught. We can also use fish farms, which are basically these giant cages that are out in seas and rivers with the fish inside them. Now, that means that they're protected from predators and it's easy to catch. You're not just going out into the ocean and trying and hoping to find some fish. You go to the cage, you lower the net and there they are. It also allows wild populations to recover. Downsides to it, though, diseases will spread quickly because they are in a cage, they're close together, and those diseases could spread to wild populations because the wild fish can come right up to the cage. Second technique is hydroponics. So this is where we're growing plants, but not in soil. They're actually growing in a solution that contains all the minerals that we need. So this means we can stack plants up because they're not having to grow in the ground, and we can control the number of minerals exactly. Combined science and biology again, this is selective breeding for everyone. So selective breeding is where we've actually as humans decided what animals or plants we're going to breed together to pass on characteristics that we deem as beneficial. So things like if we wanted to breed sheep that produce lots of wool, what we do is we pick the two sheep that have the most wool, we breed them together. Then from their offspring, we pick the ones that have the most wool again and breed them together and do that over many, many generations. Now, the idea there is obviously in each generation, the amount of wool would increase. But there are some downsides. Firstly, it reduces variation within the gene pool because we're reducing the number of alleles present, which means one disease could wipe out the lot. And it also increases the risk of inheriting a genetic disease because they tend to be recessive and the more you breed the same small group together, the more likely those recessive traits are to be passed on. Next one is genetic engineering for everyone. So genetic engineering is where we alter an organism's genome by selecting genes that create a certain characteristic. So we're changing both the genotype and the phenotype here. So what we do is we take genes from one organism that show the desired characteristic, 
and insert them into plant or animal cells at an early stage of development. For GCSE biology, we need to know the problems of this. Firstly, it's unknown long-term effects. We don't know what it's going to do if we've done this for many, many years. So possible negative effects may include health problems because we're introducing new allergens into the food and it could cross-pollinate with wild plants and disrupt the balance of our ecosystem. And of course, we can go back to the good old answer of some people believe it's unethical because we're interfering with nature. For those of you doing higher tier combined or higher tier biology, you need to know how we produce a genetically engineered organism. And basically, there are three steps. So we identify the genes that code for our desired characteristic. We remove the gene from the donor organism and insert it into the host organism. So that's the basics. We need to know a little bit more detail because this is a higher tier question. So when we're actually identifying the gene, when we cut it, we use restriction enzymes. So they cut a specific base sequence. We use the exact same restriction enzyme to cut the plasmid from our bacterial cell. And that means that we've got these little sticky ends. So they're complementary at this point. When we then put our gene with the plasmid, we use DNA ligase, which joins them together. And then we insert our plasmid into the actual bacteria. And it has the gene for something like human insulin inside it. As the bacteria then replicate, because they create genetically identical clones, every bacterial cell that comes from them will also have the human insulin gene. And this is one of the ways that we produce human insulin these days. Still for the higher tier combined and biology, we need to know the specifics about those enzymes though. So we only need to know the two at this point, restriction enzymes, cutting the donor DNA, and also our host DNA at those specific points, and ligase enzymes joining the donor gene to the plasmid. So just remember those two names because they could be picky on those. Still for the higher tier combined and GCSE biology, we need to know how we can check that gene's actually been taken up. So if we want to do that, we use what's called a marker gene. Two options for this, it could be antibiotic resistance gene or a fluorescence gene. So the way we do this, if it's an antibiotic resistance gene, you insert your marker gene into the plasmid at the same time as your desired characteristic gene, transfer your bacteria to an agar plate that contains the antibiotic, and then you incubate it, give it time to grow, and then any colonies that are growing have the gene because they've survived. If it's the fluorescent marker gene, we do the same thing. You insert it at the same time as our desired characteristic gene, transfer the bacteria to an agar plate, give it time to grow, and then you shine a UV light on it, and any of the colonies that glow, those ones have your fluorescent marker gene there. So that then means we can build large numbers of our transgenic bacteria. Back to everyone again, so combined biology, foundation and higher, we need to know about the use of biotechnology in farming. So biotechnology is the use of biological processes or living organisms to manufacture products. Two key GM crops we've got, golden rice, which is where we've taken a gene from daffodil and placed it into rice, because that means it produces beta carotene, which our body then uses to make vitamin A, which is important for good eyesight and then Bt corn, which has a gene from a bacteria inserted into maize, and it codes for a protein that's poisonous to insects. For those of you doing the higher tier, we need to know that a vector is the one that's going to transfer foreign DNA to an organism. So plasmids, virus, bacteria, all examples of vectors here. So the process by which we do this is rather similar. So the gene is cut out of our pesticide resistant plant using restriction enzyme and the DNA of our carrier or our vector is also then cut using the same restriction enzymes. We then put them together, and that means that our gene is then going to be inserted. We put it into our virus, and then it's actually going to be inserted into the plant cell by the virus because of the way in which they work. So once that's happened, then the virus inserts the DNA into our host cell, and it's incorporated into the genome there and then those plants will have that gene growing inside them, so they produce that protein. Back for everyone, so higher foundation combined and GCSE biology again, onto the disease part. We're almost there, it's the last section is the disease fun. So if someone is healthy, they're free of disease. If they're fit, they can carry out physical activity. And a disease is just a condition caused by any part of the body not functioning properly. We can group disease into two types, communicable and non-communicable. 
Communicable diseases are the ones that spread between organisms, and these are mostly caused by microorganisms. Any microorganism that causes disease is a pathogen. We need to know the four types of pathogen, an example of an animal disease and a plant disease here. So for the fungi, then athlete's foot in animals and powdery mildew in plants. For bacteria, tuberculosis and crown gall disease. Virus is influenza and tobacco mosaic virus. And the protozoa, malaria and coffee flow and necrosis. Now, scientists will actually study the incidence of a disease, which is just the rate at which new cases occur in a population over time, to know, obviously, how it's spreading and if its treatment plans are working, etc. The second type, the non-communicable diseases, are the ones that cannot spread between organisms. So common causes of these are things like poor diet leading to scurvy or obesity causing diabetes. It could be a genetic disorder like cystic fibrosis, or it could be body processes not operating correctly, so leading to things like cancer. Now, what we actually find is that when we're thinking about how these diseases spread, then infection in animals can occur through cuts in the skin, through the digestive, respiratory or reproductive systems. One way that we can have these spreading is through what's called droplet infection. So this is where when you cough or sneeze and don't cover your mouth and nose, then what happens is you just project these lovely little droplets which are filled full of the pathogens at great speed into the air surrounding you. Now, any poor person around you that happens to inhale them is inhaling little tiny droplets of moisture filled with pathogen, which is how they're likely to catch the disease you have. If we're looking at how pathogens spread between plants, it's through the soil and water. We can also see them spreading by vectors like insects, the direct contact of sap from an infected plant with a healthy plant, which could be down to feeding or agricultural damage. And it could also be airborne for things like fungal spores. When we actually get infected, you don't get ill instantly. It's not like someone sneezes next to you and then all of a sudden you're also sneezing. There's always a period of time between those two things. And that's known as the incubation period. And it's during the incubation period that the pathogens are reproducing. And as they grow, they cause cell damage and some will release toxins. So if it's a bacterium, then it's re replicating by binary fission, which is just mitosis. And they've got what's called exponential growth. So the graph for them starts quite low and then zips up very, very quickly because they can reproduce as quickly as every 20 minutes. If we're talking about a virus, then the only way they can reproduce is by taking over the host cells and using the host cell to make new virus. So your virus will infect a cell and then it uses the host cell machinery to make all the virus proteins and then it bursts out of the cell, releasing all those new little viruses. If we're looking at how we can prevent infections, then it's a few basics on hygiene that hopefully you're all taught when you were very tiny covering your mouth and nose when you cough and sneeze, obviously using protection when you have sex, it's not sharing needles if you need to use needles for anything, it's protecting yourself from animal bites, so not going up and poking a monkey and things like this, making sure that you cook your food properly, any of those common things will help you reduce your risk of infection. If a farmer identifies a disease, then what will happen if it's a plant is they will burn the diseased plant material to avoid it spreading, if it's animals, they can either treat them with drugs or if they can't treat them with drugs, they slaughter the herd and quite often burn the corpses, as we saw with the foot and mouth outbreak a few years ago. We also have restrictions on livestock movements and chemical dips so that you'd walk across basically a disinfectant before you get onto the farm. When we think about human infections, we need to know a few key examples. So the first one is athlete's foot. So the cause of athlete's foot is a parasitic fungi called a dermatophyte, and they love warm, humid conditions, hence why it's going to grow between your toes, because it's nice and warm and it's nice and moist. So what you end up with there is cracked, flaking and itchy skin. And the way that it's going to spread is either through direct or indirect contact. So generally, if you look at someone's feet and they've got cracked, flaky, itchy skin, hopefully you're not going to want to play footsie with them anyway, but just don't because it will spread or it can be from surfaces if you wander around barefoot through changing rooms, for example. Good news, it's easy to treat, get some antifungal cream, rub it on and it will clear it right up. 
Second example, food poisoning. So this is caused by a range of bacteria. So Campylobacter, which you get from raw meat or unpasteurized milk, Salmonella from raw meat and eggs, E. coli from raw or undercooked meat, for example. And what we find here is they're capable of surviving freezing and refrigeration. So the only way you actually kill them is by cooking food properly. If you do happen to get infected with these, then you can expect some fun-filled stomach pain, diarrhea, maybe explosive, vomiting, potentially projectile, maybe at the same time as your explosive diarrhea if you're really unlucky. Fever and really severe cases may lead to death. So spread through poor food hygiene and we treat it mainly with fluids. It's just a case of drink water and you will recover. Third type are the STIs, so sexually transmitted infections. And these are caused by a range of bacteria and viruses. So spread person to person through unprotected sex or genital contact and also spread by bodily fluids or skin on skin contact. Now, one of the downsides of these is they can often be asymptomatic initially which means that you're not showing any symptoms. And therefore, if you carry on practicing unprotected sex, you're spreading it to everyone you then sleep with at that point. So in terms of our protection, either A, avoid sex, or B, use protection like a condom. The pill doesn't protect you from STIs, folks. Four examples, chlamydia caused by a bacteria. So that's gonna mean pain when you urinate and discharge from the penis or the vagina there. Treated with antibiotics, Gonorrhea, again, bacteria, and you get symptoms of burning pain when you urinate and vaginal discharge, again, treated with antibiotics. Genital herpes caused by a virus, which causes these painful blisters or sores. And it is the gift that keeps on giving because there is no cure for it. So if you get genital herpes, it's for life. HIV is caused by a virus, and this one weakens your immune system, often resulting in AIDS. There's no cure, but we can actually control your symptoms using antiretrovirals again for the rest of your life there. So HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. And what it actually does is a sneaky little virus because when it's inside your body, it actually gets inside your white blood cells. So it's protected from any of your immune system responses because it's actually inside your immune system cells and it reproduces inside them. So that means your antibodies won't be able to touch them. And as those virus particles then burst out of the white blood cells, destroying them, it reduces the number of white blood cells you've got, making you way more susceptible to common infections. So AIDS is the final stage of your HIV infection where your body can't fight life-threatening infections anymore. In terms of our plant diseases, we do need to know these different examples as well. So tobacco mosaic virus, it's a virus. So it causes mottled or discolored leaves as a result of the virus preventing chloroplasts from forming. So that's going to really reduce the growth of the plant and any yields we get from it. So to prevent that one spread, you can remove the infected plants, wash hands and equipment between plantings and plant TMV resistant crops the following year. If we think about crown gall disease, it's caused by a bacterium and it enters through a wound and then it integrates a plasmid into the plant genome and this causes greater growth chemical production. Now, what that actually means is that you end up with these weird growths called galls that stick off the side of the trunk. Now, if they encircle the whole trunk, it can cut off the flow of sap, which leads to stunted growth and death. To prevent their spread, destroy infected plants and avoid susceptible planting for a while. Powdery mildew is our fungal disease, so it causes white powdery spots on the leaves and the stems, reducing growth and the leaves drop early. So it's spread when there's high humidity and moderate temperatures, and it survives on plant residues between seasons. So we can only get rid of this one by spraying with a fungicide. For those of you doing GCSE biology, we need to know about the defences that our plants have. So we've got two types of defence, physical, which are the physical barriers, and chemical defenses, which are chemicals secreted by the plant to kill them. First actual physical defense is the waxy cuticle. So that's a waxy substance that covers the epidermal cells of most parts of a plant. So it prevents water loss, first of all. It also prevents the pathogens coming into direct contact with the epidermal cells, which reduces the chance of infection. And it prevents water collecting on the leaf because the wax is hydrophobic. So water runs off 
and that means fungal spores don't germinate on your leaves. Second physical defense is the cell wall. So that one is a major defense about, against our fungal and bacterial pathogens. It's a structural barrier. Now, all plants have a primary cell wall, which provides them with that support, and it's made of those cellulose fibers. What we also find, though, is that those cellulose fibers are actually cross-linked with other substances like pectin, which forms this gel to help cement the neighboring cells together. We also find that many cells have a secondary cell wall inside their primary. In terms of the chemical defenses of our plants, we've got a range. So citronella and pine resin are insect repellents. So any of you that have been silly enough to fall for the scam of those silly little bracelet things that are apparently exam boosters, adding 5% to your grades, they're just citronella bracelets, folks. You won't get bitten by a mosquito in your exam, but that's about it, I'm afraid. Pyrethrins are insecticides. Phenols will disrupt chemical, um, sorry, not chemical, will disrupt bacterial cell walls and defenses disrupt the cell membrane. You've got chitinases, which break down chitin in the fungal cell walls and caffeine, which is toxic to fungi and insects. And then we've got cyanide, which is just toxic to any living thing at all. For those of you doing higher tier GCSE biology, you need to know about how we can diagnose plant diseases. So in the field, we've got two ways, observation and microscopy. So with observation, we look for the visual symptoms of plant diseases like discolored leaves, rotting deposits, etc. And microscopy is used to identify the pathogen. Light microscopy is usually enough at this point, which is good news, but sometimes electron microscopy is needed for an accurate diagnosis. Downside here, though, is that in the field, we will only identify them when an infection has taken hold, so when you can actually see the symptoms. The other alternative is using lab techniques. So we can use DNA analysis, which is where we're going to actually end up with our DNA fingerprint. So hopefully we know that when we've got it, you have these little lines that are basically the bands. Now, if we've got two examples, just give me one second to draw it. So if that's our DNA fingerprint, very rough diagram, then we could see that because the bands of A and B line up perfectly, then our pathogen is whatever A was. Whereas you can see it doesn't line up with C, which means it's not whatever our standard C was. So just by looking at the bands, you can identify which pathogen it is. Second option is antigen identification, which is basically when we've got the protein spikes on the surface, those are the antigens and specific antigens are found on specific pathogens, and we can identify them using chemical analysis. So combined science, GCSE biology foundation and higher, everyone back together again now for the blood and body defense mechanisms. In terms of what happens if you cut yourself, then when you actually cut yourself, then platelets actually change the blood protein fibrinogen into fibrin. Now, that means we get a network of fibers in the cut itself. Red blood cells get trapped in the fibers, which forms a blood clot. And then as that clot hardens, it forms a scab. So that scab then means pathogens can't get in. And it also means that the skin underneath can heal. And when that happens, your scab falls off. That's why you shouldn't pick them off early. We do have non-specific responses to prevent the entry of microorganisms. So things like your skin is a physical barrier to stop things getting in. You've got stomach acid, which kills any pathogens present on food and drink. You've got ciliar and mucus in your airways. You've got nasal hairs and tears. All of them are trying to stop pathogens getting inside your body in the first place. If things do get inside, then we have two types of white blood cell. We have phagocytes, which engulf and digest in a process called phagocytosis and lymphocytes, which produce antibodies or antitoxins. Hopefully we remember an antibody is a protein that binds to the antigens on the surface of our pathogen. A lot of key words that you're going to mix up here if you're not careful. So antigen, the protein spikes on the pathogen. Antibody is a protein made by your lymphocytes, which binds to the antigens. Once that's happened, the pathogen can then be ingested by the phagocyte and that means they will be engulfed and digested. When you've actually been infected with a pathogen and your body has made antibodies to it, 
then some of those white blood cells that made the antibodies actually remain as what's called a memory cell. So that means that if you're infected with the exact same pathogen, with those same antigens on the surface a second time, then your body responds faster, produces antibodies quicker, and will eliminate the pathogen before you show symptoms. And that's what we mean by immunity. For those of you doing GCSE biology higher tier, you need to know about monoclonal antibodies. Now, monoclonal antibodies are produced in the lab using these cells called hybridomas. Now, hybridomas are a fusion of a myeloma and a lymphocyte. A myeloma is a cancer cell. So what we actually have as the reason we call them monoclonal antibodies is because we're producing them by a single clone of cells. Now, each monoclonal antibody is designed to target a specific type of cell and they will bind to the antigens on their target cell and either kill it or prevent it from operating effectively. So the way in which we make them is we start off with our GM mice and we inject them with the required antigen. As a result of that antigen being in their body, they produce antibodies to the antigen and then we collect those lymphocytes from them. We then fuse those lymphocytes with a myeloma cell to make our hybridoma. And the reason we've got to do this is because our lymphocytes can't survive outside the body on their own. They have to be fused to that myeloma. And myeloma cells, because they're cancer cells, reproduce indefinitely. As those hybridoma cells reproduce, then they form clones. And each clone produces the required antibody, which we can then harvest. And that's our monoclonal antibody. In terms of where we use them still for the GCSE biology higher tier only folks, number one is in pregnancy testing. So HCG is produced about two weeks after conception and we can actually use monoclonal antibodies that bind to HCG and produce a color change reaction. So on the pregnancy test stick, you can actually put a little band of those monoclonal antibodies so that when the prospective mother pees on the stick, if HCG is present in the urine, then it will obviously react with the monoclonal antibodies and make the dark line or the little plus sign. We can also use them for, de for detecting disease because they act as markers by binding to a specific antigen to confirm its presence. So things like prostate cancer are a good example of that. We can also use them in treating cancers because they're able to target specific cells resulting in their death. So that that means that we can actually attach drugs onto them and that means they're going to target specific cells to deliver the drug. So that minimizes disruption or damage to surrounding tissue. Back for everyone again. So combined science, GCSE biology, higher and foundation for vaccines. So a vaccine will contain a small amount of dead or attenuated pathogen. Attenuated just means weakened. So when we insert it into the body, usually by an injection, then your lymphocytes produce antibodies to that pathogen. We then have our memory cells, which if you remember are the ones that already know how to make the antibody. And that means that if you encounter the same pathogen later, the memory cells replicate quickly, produce the antibodies before your symptoms show. Another key word we need to know is antiseptic. So these are used on external living surfaces, like your skin, to kill or neutralize all types of pathogen, but they don't damage human tissue. Now, different antiseptics act on different microorganisms, but good examples are alcohol and iodine. We also have disinfectants, which do that exact same job, but on non-living surfaces. So antiseptic on your skin, disinfectant on your desk. Antivirals are drugs that destroy viruses, whereas an antibiotic will kill bacterial cells. Do remember antivirals are generally specific here and will be acting on one type of virus at a time. So the way they can do this is by blocking activity like preventing the actual virus entering the host cell or preventing it from releasing its genetic material. When we're talking about our antibiotics, as we said, they kill bacteria without damaging your cells. And what we've got are several different types of antibiotic that actually affect the range of bacteria. So the way that they can do this is by disrupting cell walls and so forth. If we need to identify the bacteria present, we need to take blood or stool samples, send them to a lab where they grow them on agar plates, and then we use antibiotic discs to identify it. Now, the antibiotic discs, when you've got your agar plate and you've put these little circles that contain the antibiotic on there, you get a zone of inhibition around them. 
So that's just a region where bacterial growth is prevented. So what we need to do, if they ask you about this and how we could actually work out which is the best antibiotic to use, is the one with the largest area of the zone of inhibition. So it's the area of a circle, which is pi r squared. And remember, the radius is half the diameter. For GCSE biology, folks, we need to know about aseptic technique. So aseptic technique prevents foreign microorganisms from being introduced into our test sample and it ensures that the apparatus in the environment remains sterile. So it's things like before you do anything, you've washed your working area with alcohol so that any microorganisms there are killed. You wear gloves if you're at risk of working with pathogens to prevent any sort of crossing from skin, etc. We autoclave glassware and apparatus and work close to a Bunsen flame to prevent any other contaminations. When we're actually carrying out our microbiology practical, and again, this is just for GCSE biology folks, then we have a little wire loop. Now, the first thing, you need to sterilize it by holding it in a blue Bunsen flame. Now, we heat it until it's red, and then you cool it close to the flame. You're not waving it around over here, because that means it's getting covered with all of the bacteria in the air. So you hold it close to the Bunsen flame to let it cool down. Then you take your sample, and then you make your streak plate. Now, when my lot tried this, they pretty much drew a square in bacteria. But if you make a good streak plate, then what happens is you're spreading out the actual bacterial colonies until you're left with individual ones on the plate. So you make four or five streaks across one edge, reflame your loop and cool it, twist the plate, and then make four or five new streaks, hold the, loop, the actual loop in the flame again, twist it, four or five new streaks, and then we incubate. So as I said, in theory, what you're doing there is you're spreading them out more and more so you end up with individual colonies. If we want to identify bacteria once we've grown them, the main way we do that, first of all, is by looking at it. So the shape, the color, whether it's a smooth edge or a crinkly edge, whether it's elevated or flat, all of that gives us a lot of information about what type of bacteria it can be. Once you've got a good idea, you can then isolate it down to just the individual species by carrying out chemical tests. Now, what we actually then need to come on to for the combined and the GCSE Biology Higher and Foundation is looking at new drugs. And we are almost there, good news. We're going to go just past half seven, but hopefully in about the next 10 minutes, we'll be done. Now, when we're talking about new drugs, we generally get these from plant extracts, or we can just create completely synthetic drugs in the lab these days. So the first step is using a computer model to develop possible new drugs because it produces a list of compounds that may target a certain condition. So once a potential drug has been identified, we test in a lab to see how it behaves. And we use preclinical tests for this. So we use live cells, bacteria, and tissue culture. The idea being that if you obviously have your little tissue culture dish with your chemical actual drug you're testing, and it's just killed all of the cells in there, you're not gonna go on to any other tests. It's clearly not working. So that's obviously to identify if there's any significant problems. If it passes the preclinical trial, then we move on to the animal testing stage. And it's got to pass with two species before human trials can commence. The reason we use two species is to obviously give a wider range of potential effects to be identified. And a good example of where we didn't do this was with thalidomide, because when we did the animal trial, then it didn't show any negative effects. Had they used different animals, they'd have seen that there were some quite unpleasant effects of it and it wouldn't have gone on to those pregnant women and caused the big problems. When we are using the animal trials, then we use our three R's principles. So reduction, we use the smallest number of animals possible. We refine the actual experiment to avoid any unnecessary suffering and make sure that the animals are well cared for. And we replace any animals with other techniques where possible. If it passes the animal trials, we go on to clinical trials, which is a three stage process on humans. Step one is using healthy volunteers to look for any side effects. Step two, a small sample of volunteers with the condition. Number one, to see how effective it actually is and to check it works on the humans. And if it does that, we go on to step three, our large number of volunteers with the condition, and we use it to test effectiveness and check for safety. One other thing we need to bear in mind when we talk about drugs is the placebo effect, which is where people start to feel better because they expect to feel better, even if they've got nothing that's actually making them feel better. So what we actually do here is we use something called a double blind trial. 
So in a double blind trial, neither the doctor nor the patients know who's receiving a drug and who's receiving the placebo. So what happens there is it removes that placebo effect because people are just getting these drugs. They don't know which is which. It removes that element of bias. So the doctor's not putting forward their views, etc. Last little bits we need to look at are the non-communicable diseases. One, smoking. Four key things to remember here. Tar collects in the lungs, and that's bad because it's carcinogenic. It causes cancer. Nicotine is the addictive drug that affects our nervous system, making your heart beat faster, narrows your blood vessels. Carbon monoxide binds irreversibly to the hemoglobin, which means that you can't transport as much, much oxygen, meaning your heart has to work harder. And particulates are these small pieces of solid that get engulfed by white blood cells, and we can get emphysema as a result of this. Second choice you can make in your lifestyle is to consume alcohol, and that contains ethanol, which affects the nervous system. So it's a depressant, which means it slows down the body's reactions. Short-term effects are the less serious ones, so blurred vision, loss of balance, slower reaction times, change in behavior, generally things that lead to embarrassing photos later on your social media, but not anything too long-lived. And the long-term effects are the ones that are pretty much more damaging. So cirrhosis, which is where your healthy liver cells have been replaced with fat or fibrous tissue, which means your liver is less effective. Heart disease, stomach ulcers, all of those are the long-term effects of alcohol use. Cardiovascular disease is a biggie. So this is a disease of the heart or blood vessels, and it's a massive thing in our developed countries at the minute. So one of these is atherosclerosis, which is the hardening and narrowing of your arteries. So the fat gets deposited in the artery walls. And then as that hardens and then basically just encroaches further and further, there's less space for the blood to flow through. Now, we can also get cardiovascular disease as a result of a blood clot called a thrombosis. Now, if that occurs in one of your coronary arteries, which are the ones that supply your heart, then it's going to cause a heart attack. If it's actually occurring in an artery that supplies the brain, it's a stroke. In terms of the risk factors for CVD, then too much salt in your diet results in more water being absorbed into the blood after the filtration in your kidney, and that leads to higher blood pressure. If you eat a lot of saturated fats in your diet, we get cholesterol deposited in the artery walls, and that means narrow blood vessels, restricting blood flow, increasing blood pressure. So if they give you a question about how we could reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, stop smoking, reduce the salt, reduce the saturated fat, any of those are good. You could also say take regular exercise because that's obviously going to lower your cholesterol levels as well. If obviously you do have cardiovascular disease, it's not a case of you just need to change your diet and lifestyle. We can also use medications to treat this. So we have statins, which reduce blood cholesterol by preventing its formation. Antiplatelets, which reduce the stickiness of platelets so they don't clot as much. Beta blockers, which block the effects of adrenaline to slow heart rate and improve blood flow. And nitrates widen the blood vessels by relaxing the blood vessel walls. If that doesn't work, we can use surgery so we can replace valves if they're faulty to prevent, obviously, the blood going the wrong way. We can use angioplasty, which is where we insert a stent so that it, arter it widens your arteries, again, if they're partially blocked. If we're getting more serious, we may need coronary bypass, which is where we take a blood vessel from somewhere else in your body and then basically replace the coronary artery that's blocked with it. Or you may need a heart transplant. And because, obviously, your heart has to be perfectly matched and you can't just get a heart from someone who's going to carry on living, then a lot of people will die on the heart transplant list. Now, in terms of our transplants, as we've said, the organs have to be matched to the recipient, otherwise your body will reject it because it recognizes it as foreign tissue and your immune system then just attacks it and kills it. So to reduce the risk of rejection, we carry out tissue matching, first of all, to match the donor organ to the recipient. And we use immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their life, which basically just keeps the immune system working at a lower rate. In terms of any modern advances we've got, we go back to our stem cell, which is our unspecialized cell, and we will take these from embryos, hence embryonic stem cell. The reason we use the embryonic stem cells is because they can differentiate into any cell type. So generally, fertility treatments where you've got leftover embryos, that's a source of these. In terms of what we can use our stem cells for, we can test new drugs for safety and effectiveness, 
we could potentially reverse damage caused by disease like Parkinson's. There are some concerns though, so we don't actually know the long-term side effects, maybe increased cancer risk, we're not sure. And there's also the possible rejection of foreign material in our body. We've also got this idea of gene therapy, which is where we replace a fully functioning allele for the faulty allele. So what we're actually doing here is in cystic fibrosis, we're replacing the faulty CFTR gene with a normal CFTR gene so that the channel protein works perfectly. So we use a restriction enzyme to cut the normal version of the gene from the DNA of a healthy person. We produce lots of copies of that normal allele, and then we insert that into the normal, into the cells of the person using something like an inhaler usually in a, with a virus. Problem with this is that it will go into the target cells, but it may not go into every target cell. We also might find the healthy alleles might join the chromosome in a random place, so it doesn't work properly. And it's only short lived because when those cells are replaced, you're back to your original DNA, which has the faulty allele in there. The very last thing is the human genome project, which we mentioned earlier in terms of its uses. So we can use the Human Genome Project to locate genes that may be linked to inherited diseases. We can actually develop drugs that directly target disease-causing genes or the proteins that they produce. We can potentially develop new gene therapy treatments. And also one that's quite a very new idea is developing personalized medicines. So they're targeted medications that have much greater success rates and fewer side effects. So that has covered everything in B4, 5 and 6. Now, in terms of the assessed practicals for this one, if my memory serves for combined, it's only the sampling in this one. And for the triple, you've got the sampling and the uh, microbiology techniques. The rest of your assessed practicals were actually in your first biology paper. So I don't think there's many that you could be asked on there. So hopefully that's helped you out a little bit. If there are any bits on there that you're still not 100% certain on, then head on over to the relevant playlists on my channel and you can watch those bits. Obviously, if there are any things that you're still not certain on, you can quickly post a message in the chat window and I will go over those before we finish. But otherwise, make sure that you do actually get some sleep tonight. I know it's tempting to stay up all night and revise, but it won't help you out in the long run. Make sure you do read the questions carefully. If you are drawing one of the Punnett squares for a genetic cross, make sure that your letters are quite clearly capital or lowercase. Some of you have shocking handwriting and I can't tell the difference as a marker. So make it really clear if it's a capital or a lowercase letter there. And remember to fully label any of your diagrams. So good luck tomorrow. Make sure you read your questions. Hopefully the paper will be a little bit uh, nicer than the first one. But if not, we can all just hope for lower grade boundaries in the summer anyway. So good luck, folks. And we'll be having our Chemistry C4, 5 and 6 live seminar on Tuesday night at 6.30. So join us then where we can go through all of our chemistry.